y'all, Rev Tommy Two-Tone, that's Reverend Tom Salter, coming to you today from Summerton United Methodist Church from the pulpit. It is Palm Sunday, and it is a very sad day for me. Um, the last three weeks we've done our live stream. It really hadn't affected me that much, but today on Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, and I look out at it to an empty church, and it breaks my heart. But I know why we're having to do it, and so it's okay. But I want to encourage you today to pray. It's our most powerful tool. It's really the most powerful tool we have. Also, keep your distance and wash your hands. But remember, God loves you. We at Summerton United Methodist Church love you. And we're praying for you. And we hope and trust that you're praying for us as well. Stay safe and stay tuned for the Palm Sunday Sermon today. Good morning from Summerton United Methodist Church. We are not gathered today, which is heartbreaking to me on Palm Sunday, but we're coming to you live on Facebook and recorded on YouTube. Now, I will say this as a word of uh, information. It took 23 hours last week for me to upload my YouTube video, so it may not be posted until tomorrow, which would be Monday. But today is the beginning of Holy Week, the most holy of weeks for those of us that serve and attend liturgical churches. And even in churches that are not liturgical, they will celebrate Palm Sunday and Easter. So this begins for the Christian, the most holy of weeks. So I decided to go ahead and wear my robe and try to create a semblance of normalcy, uh, mainly for probably my own benefit more than yours. It makes me feel more normal being up here. Because when I stare out at an empty church, it really breaks my heart. It's, it's very hard to preach to an empty church, where in your mind you may think it would be easier. It's much easier when you have people that are looking back at you and maybe give you a nod of agreement or an amen or, or something like that when you say something that, and, and it's good to feel like it's been confirmed. I would also like to encourage you uh, to my congregation to send your tithe checks to Donna, and you know who she is. Those of you who are not members but would like to donate to the church during this time, if you've got a little extra something, that's great. If you don't, that's fine as well. You can go to my PayPal account. There will be a link in the YouTube description, and I will go ahead and put one in the Facebook description uh, later this afternoon. I'd like to begin our service with an opening prayer today, and we're going to do somewhat of a little bit of liturgy as we will recite the Apostles' Creed for those Methodists or those that use the Creed at home that would like to recite it with me, that would be awesome. Just to create a semblance of normalcy, we invite the Holy Spirit to come in and be with us today, wherever you're watching, from your home, from your porch. Grab a cup of coffee if you want to. This is a time where we don't care if you have a cup of coffee during service. You're not going to mess anything up but your own home. So do that if you want to. And let's begin with a prayer. Almighty God, on this day, your son, Jesus Christ, entered the holy city of Jerusalem and was proclaimed king by those who spread their garments and palm branches along the way. Let those branches be for us today signs of victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our Lord and Savior and follow him in a way that leads to eternal life. In the name of Jesus Christ, the king, we pray. Amen. Now, if you know the Apostles' Creed, or if you don't, that's fine. If you're looking at this on a recorded version, you can pause it and Google it. We will recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now our scripture lesson today on Palm Sunday comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. That's Matthew 21, 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem 
and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and put their cloaks on them and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds went ahead of him that followed and were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth, Nazareth in Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, this being Holy Week, I'd like to give you an overview of the events that begin on Palm Sunday. Maybe it'll help you appreciate how quickly the tide turned. Kind of like the events we're in today. The tide of our lives are turning every single day. There's new information coming out. New things that we have to do to stay safe with this virus. Well, can you imagine a king coming into a city and people everywhere gathered to worship this king, to call him Hosanna in the highest heaven. Things were changing rapidly. Let me tell you how rapidly they changed in this story today. Because I want you to appreciate the proximity of everything. It happened within the radius of one mile. Think about it. If you've ever been there, you would have been in arm's reach of the Savior. The question is this, though. Would you have been among those who shouted, Hosanna in the highest? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Or, or would you have been among those who cried out a week later, crucify him, crucify him? Well, I can tell you assuredly that some of those people were both. They praised him on Palm Sunday and cried for his head to crucify him just a short week later. Really a little less than a week later. But that's what the events of Palm Sunday are all about. So let's get started. Picture this. You're sitting on top of the Mount of Olives, overlooking the city of Jerusalem. What stands out is the gold-plated dome of the rock. You've seen it a hundred times in pictures. And if you have it, you can Google it now. In front of it and to the left of it are the walls of the old city. To your right on about the same level as the old Roman road. It winds down the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem from Bethany. It was down that road that Jesus came the day he made his triumphal entry. About midway down the hill, he stopped and cried, Jerusalem, Jerusalem who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I would have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you would not. The Garden of Gethsemane is directly in front of you. You can't see it because of the slope. It's only a short walk, though, through the trees. It's where Jesus prayed the night he was arrested. And we will talk about that later this week. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, he said in the garden. Nevertheless, not what I desire, but what your will be. Between you and the Dome of the Rock is the Kidron Valley. And if you look carefully, slightly to the left, you can see stone steps leading up into the hillside. They lead to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest. That's where Jesus was taken when he was arrested. The Jewish leaders were already there waiting to interrogate him. In the basement is a dungeon. That's where Jesus was kept overnight. Just outside in a courtyard, you can see from where you're sitting is where Peter was warming himself by the fire. Three times he was identified as one of Jesus' followers. Three times he denied it. 
Just beyond Caiaphas' house is Mount Zion, the holy mountain of God. It's covered with houses as it was in Jesus' day. Back then it was known as the Essene Quarter. The Essenes were Jewish mystics. They lived quiet, com- contemplative lives, praying to God and observing all kinds of spiritual disciplines. Some believe Jesus was an Essene because of the way he talked openly about God as his father and frequently went off by himself to pray. It was in the Essene quarter that Jesus and his disciples met in an upper room to celebrate Passover. And it would be the last time that they ate together. Of course, the temple is no longer standing. The Romans tore it down around 70 AD. But in Jesus' day, it was the focal point of the city. It stood where the Dome of the Rock stands today. And if you use your imagination, you can picture the various courtyards surrounding the Holy of Holies rising up in the center. The temple was a short walk from Caiaphas' house. The temple guards led Jesus to the temple early Friday morning. And again, he stood before the council. This time he was condemned for blasphemy, claiming to be the son of God. Caiaphas ordered him to be sent to Pontius Pilate because he had been held as the king of the Jews, and that's treason. Pilate held court in the Antonio Fortress. One of the corner watchtowers still stands today. You can see it from where you're sitting, just beyond the Dome of the Rock. In the center of the Antonio Fortress is a paved courtyard where Roman soldiers milled around. That's where Jesus was stripped and mocked and crowned with the crown of thorns, and then flogged. The streets of the old city wind from the Antonio Fortress to a hill of Golgotha. It was along this path that Jesus was forced to carry his own cross to be crucified. Today we call it Via Della Rosa, the road of suffering and pain. The hill of Golgotha today lies beneath the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You can see it the roof of the church from where you're sitting. There's an altar table inside that sits on top of the hill of Golgotha. Beneath it is a cylindrical hole carved into the limestone. It's where the base of a cross would have been inserted. And you can feel it with your hand. The tomb of Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea is a short walk away. It's where Jesus' body was taken to be buried. Get the picture? If so, consider this. There are two different worlds represented here. One, Jesus' followers. Those who were quick to pay him homage and sing his praise. The other, his enemies. Those were who were just as quick to condemn him and call for his death. They stand so close to each other, it's hard to tell them apart. That's the point. As followers of Jesus, we're never more than a stone's throw away from the other side. In his book, One Inch from the Fence, Wes Selinger tells about taking his son to the Houston Zoo. One of the regular stops was where the alligator swamps were to see an alligator who was famously named Scarface. The ugliest, most vicious looking creature who ever crawled the earth, according to Wes. He was basking in the sun when they got there and Wes writes, my son had a bag of marshmallows. I offered one to Scarface with my fingers, only one inch from the fence. I tossed the great treat. Chunk! The sound gave me goosebumps. Alligator jaws chomping at a marshmallow, a dramatic example of what the boys in the Pentagon still call overkill. Scarface opened wide for more. Chunk! This was getting to be fun. In no time, he had emptied the bag. All the while, my hand was one inch from becoming... Gator Burger, a frightening but exhilarating experience. One of those rare surrealistic moments we all cherish. Think of this as a metaphor. As you're trying to be faithful and righteous and good, you're never more than one inch away from the fence where danger and downfall are just awaiting to slip you up. It happens. One of the sweetest men I've ever known started off working as a teller at a bank. He got behind with his bills and began robbing Peter to pay Paul. As he put it, he got caught and was sent to prison for embezzlement. And he's not the only one. 
What starts off as a little innocent flirtation in the office leads to an extramarital affair and a broken home. For some, a few social drinks with friends leads to a life of alcoholism. For others, a little extra petting on a date gets out of hand and results in teen pregnancy. We want to be faithful. We want to do what's right. We all have good intentions. Have you ever met one who intended to get in trouble? You see, the problem is our humanness. It gets in the way. We're easily tempted. It's so much easier to go along with the crowd. Even Paul said, I find then the law that to me, while I desire to be good, evil is present. Besides, life is ambiguous. Some claim Jesus was the Messiah, while others claim that he was a heretic. Who are you going to believe? Standing on the Mount of Olives on that Palm Sunday morning, it's easy to believe he was the one. Born in Bethlehem in the house of David, yet raised as a Nazarene, riding into town on the foal of an ass, just as Zechariah had prophesied. The pieces all fit together. Standing on the Mount Zion, it was clear Jesus broke the law, though. He gave the Torah his own interpretation. He claimed to be the Son of God. How was this different from the false prophets who came before him? Consider this. It's altogether possible. That in some very, some of the very same people who cheered him on Sunday morning were of the same crowd who called for his execution on Friday afternoon. And his disciples were no exception. For example, Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Peter denied ever having known him three times. Thomas was nowhere to be found when Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room following the resurrection. Later, when Jesus met the disciples up in Galilee, only seven of the original 12 could be accounted for. Human nature is fickle. Just ask any public servant, school superintendent, football coach, or pastor. It's the same people who want to enshrine you one day will be out to lynch you the next. We switch loyalties as quickly as we change our long-distance carriers and our internet providers. The distance between the Mount of Olives and the Mount Zion is minuscule. As much as you may be try to be faithful, you're never more than a stone's throw away from the other side. You're never more than one inch from the fence. The good news is this. If Mount Zion is only a stone's throw away from the Mount of Olives, so is the Mount of Olives only a stone throw away from Mount Zion. No matter how far you stray, you're that close to the mercies of God. All you have to do is reach out to Jesus and he'll take you by the hand and lead you to the throne of God's grace. One of my best friends in seminary was a very gifted minister. He excelled as a student pastor and he quickly rose through the ranks of the church. And whether he had a tragic flaw or simply the pressures of ministry got to him, he began staying out late at night and drinking heavily. It was a downward spiral. His marriage ended and he was forced to leave the ministry. And I lost touch with him for several years. But then through social media, our paths crossed again. And I couldn't believe what I saw. He posted a picture of himself clean shaven. He had a good job. We renewed our online friendship and he told me all about his journey to hell and back. With the help of AA and what he liked to call other drunks like him, he said God's spirit had touched his heart and turned his life around. And then he said something I'll never forget. He said the whole time he was off drinking and gambling and chasing women, what he most wanted and needed was right there at the tip of his fingertips. The peace and love and joy that he longed for were there all along if he'd only been willing to accept it. Here's what I hope you'll take with you today. You're standing with the crowd on the Mount of Olives. You're part of the multitude singing to Jesus as he enters the city. Who knows where you'll be tomorrow? Remember, 
We're only one inch from the fence. Be careful. Alligators aren't the only ones who bite. Be quick to call on the Lord for strength. Withstand the temptation and keep the faith. That's what Robert Robertson did in this prayer. He said, come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Now, I know there are preachers out there who would have sang that to you and done a fine job, but I'm trying to keep an audience and I don't want you to tune out, so I'll just read it to you. And I understand that, you know, I'm not a singer. I get that. I'd love to be a singer. I guess there's a lot of singers that want to be preachers as well. And then there's some that can do both. They got a double extra measure of God's grace, I suppose. But I thought I would be gracious to you and not sing. We're living in an uncertain time. And this begins Holy Week. Just a quick announcement. I want to let you know that every day this week at noon, I will be coming online live on Facebook to do a daily Holy Week devotion. We'll read some scripture. We'll pray together. We need to be praying right now. Like I said, it's our strongest and most powerful tool. God, I believe, is going to show up and show out in a mighty way during this COVID-19 virus. This is a time that's going to pull us together. It's a time that Christians need to be standing up and preaching the word of God to a lost and dying world. Friends, there are people dying all around us. I know of a young man who died at age 42 just two nights ago because of the COVID virus. There's a young police officer in a town very close to us right now fighting for his life. He's in his 30s. And he's in the ICU with the COVID-19. It's all around us. It's not getting any better at the moment. We haven't reached the peak. So get on your knees because I believe that's where we'll stand the tallest. Thanks for joining me. Let us pray. Gracious God, in your infinite mercy and in your infinite wisdom, you know what's going on on this earth. But we don't. We're just here for the ride. But Lord, help us to stay away from that fence, knowing that we're only one inch away. Help us to stay strong. Help our faith to get stronger during this time. Come and be with us and walk with us. Help us to do the right thing, to make the wise decisions, to be with our leaders, our doctors and our nurses, our frontline people, our first responders, Lord, those people out there, even the people delivering food. Pray that your mighty hand of healing and grace would be upon this world and that you would get the glory and the honor where it belongs. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen and amen. Go in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.